Laura Moody, who I talked about before as being one of those people who was in the trenches saying, we need, we can't do the law like that, we need to do it like this. And I remember, in particular, one of Laura's things, if I'm not mistaken, Laura, was the hearsay exception. Yes. yes. So I think one of the things that you, we heard about earlier was this idea that um, in, in criminal cases, a lot of times we have victims who may have some capacity issues, or they may be reluctant to testify. So one of the things that Laura made sure we put into that 2014 law was an exception to hearsay, which means that a police officer who comes on the scene who learns from the victim that this caregiver or girlfriend or whatever has stolen $550,000, if two or three or four months later, the victim says, I don't want to prosecute, I love her, or she's my friend, that police officer can come into court and testify, even though it's hearsay, that the victim told him that the money had been stolen. So Laura really kind of, you know, she really like was in the trenches and then turned this law, the exploitation law, into what it is today. And so Laura's here with Karen Murillo, who we already heard about. I don't Karen Murillo probably doesn't even know that her ears should be burning all day today. Because Nick Cox talked about Karen and how Nick has stolen her and that she's this fire starter and she's this awesome person. So we don't even need to talk about her that much. But she's been also in the trenches prosecuting these cases. We also have Twyla Sketchley, who also helped draft the initial exploitation legislation. And Twyla has been a, an exploitation educator for ever. Before it became a thing, Twyla was out there really talking about the need for better laws on exploitation. And she also is an elder law attorney who does the same kind of work that Victoria and all, a lot, all our elder law attorneys. Can you guys raise your hands? Come on. They're, they're out there, and they're doing the same So, you know, these people are here, they're here to talk about, and Victoria's in charge, so I'm just going to be quiet, but um, let's have some chat. Let it, let it be. All right, thanks, Shannon. All right, so uh, Victoria Hewler, uh, Tallahassee, as Shannon said, so what I'd like to do is have each of our panelists uh, introduce themselves for a minute or two, uh, and talk about uh, where you are now, what your jobs are. Um, I think both Karen and Laura have been places and are now in new places, so they can kind of... Um, I assume still current passion about um, preventing and defending um, so that we protect people against exploitation. And of course, Wild is a um, terrific board certified elder law attorney in Tallahassee uh, doing this in the civil arena. So, Laura, I'm going to start with you. So, tell us uh, who you are, where you are now, and uh, what's your like, what's your typical contact would be with exploitation? Maybe not so much now, but in the past, particularly. So, go ahead. Absolutely. So I'm sure you guys are thinking about two things right now. First is what kind of ice cream you're going to get when you're done. <laughs> and the second, you're probably thinking, is she related to Ashley Moody? But no, I am not. Um, I get that every time now. So coincidentally, though, the reason that I ended up in elder and economic crimes at the state attorney's office in Brevard was that Nick Cox had offered me a job as a statewide prosecutor. Our prosecutor at the time was Norman Wolfinger. And he said, hey, don't go there. I'd like to start an elder and economic crimes division in Brevard County, and I want you to run it. So that was back in 2011. That's when I started meeting all these wonderful women and men in the, in the industry. And so I started that back in 2011 at the state attorney's office. I had been there since 2000. Firstly, as a victim advocate, I had gone to law school, come back as a prosecutor, been in pretty much every division at the state attorney's office. And then, coincidentally, met Sheriff Wayne Ivey, for those of you all who are familiar with him, on the elder and economic crime kind of circuit, because he's very passionate about it as well. So now I'm actually at the Sheriff's Office as his legal counsel 
as of July. So elder and economic crimes will always be my passion. I now actually sit two doors down from my sergeant who was the head of the economic crimes unit when I was the assistant state attorney sitting on that unit. Now I just um, belong to the sheriff's office instead. So still very passionate about it and happy to be here. Thank you. Hey, I have a quick question for you, Laura. So now that you're at the sheriff's office, do you help uh, the sheriff set policy regarding uh, addressing elder exploitation and abuse and neglect and that kind of thing? It pretty much, my days are amazing now. It's, it's a little bit of everything every day. So yes, so where I'm currently housed, I'm still housed with an investigative body. I do the risk protection orders, the asset forfeitures that I want to talk about in conjunction with exploitation. I think there is room for that across the state that people haven't really um, gotten into too much. Um, but yes, so the Economic Crimes Unit, who is like our specialized law enforcement that addresses our elder and exploitation cases in Brevard County, I'm housed with them as well. So they're in my office all the time. I'm down visiting them all the time. I actually see the prosecutor who took my old position. She's in there once a week. So, so yes, but on a day-to-day -day basis, it's just a variety of everything. Okay, cool. We're going to talk to you about your experiences as a former prosecutor in a few minutes. So. Yes. All right, well, who are you? What are you doing? And how do you typically see exploitation in your daily life? Okay, so I'm a board certified elder law attorney in Tallahassee. I'm also licensed in Montana. Um, when David this morning brought up the Montana scam writer, I knew exactly what he was talking about. <laughs> So um, I have been an elder law attorney for almost 20 years, um, and I see exploitation almost every day. Um, I currently have three open exploitation cases on my desk, one of which involved Homeland Security um, rating, and I say rating because the guardian actually cooperated with the people who came into the house. Um, an old lady's house and taking a number of stolen cloned credit cards, her iPad, her computer, her cell phone, her burner phone, and one other thing I can't remember. Um, and so I do the civil side. I try desperately to get the law enforcement people in my area to prosecute these and the state attorneys, or, or to charge these and the state attorneys to prosecute. Um, I must say that I am regularly disappointed in that area. If I can get one side to cooperate, I can't get the other. Um, I'm pretty sure that it's a civil matter, is programmed into um, law enforcement officers as they go through training, and I can say that because my daughter is actually a law enforcement agency, or a law enforcement um, officer. I looked at the training manual that law enforcement officers are taught with, through the academy, and it is hopefully inadequate and, and wrong in at least three places. So, um, <laughs> well, and I told my daughter that. <laughs> so, how are you, and we'll get into more detail, but like, just why does exploitation become part of your uh, practice? Is that a normal part of an elder law practice? I would say yes, it's a normal part of elder law practice because if you're an elder law attorney, you're working with the population we're talking about. And either you are helping the vulnerable adult protect themselves, or you're helping them get their money back, or you're helping to their family members recover it. So, um, and I would say that almost every elder law attorney I know would say the same thing. I mean, I know Victoria and I work as co-counsel, as friendly counsel, as opposing counsel, and you know, we're, we're a small bar up in Tallahassee. Um, and so I know her practice looks a lot like mine, and so it's every day. Thank you. Karen, who are you, where you were? What did you do before, where you work now? And see, I, I heard that you guys heard all about me before I even got here. <laughs> so, oh, Karen, sorry, I forgot. I got the, the notes, I forget, you know what I'm saying. My name is Karen Barilla. I currently work with the Office of Attorney General and Office for Statewide Prosecution. Um, I'm working in conjunction with the Attorney General's Senior Protection Team up in Tallahassee. And I started that position at the beginning of August of this year. Prior to that, I was a prosecutor in Palm Beach County uh, for over six years and handled primarily elder exploitation and um, senior fraud uh, in the past three plus years at the State Attorney's Office of Palm Beach County. And as you can probably imagine, 
like all of Florida, but even more concentrated, South Florida tends to be a very hotbed for this type of subject matter. So we definitely have a lot of that going on there and more business than we can keep up with for sure as prosecution and for law enforcement purposes. Um, I have been targeting and working on all aspects of what we're talking about here um, in these presentations I've seen today prevention, identifying, and also prosecuting. And one of the first and primary identifiable issues that the Attorney General, Ashley Moody, identified, that we've identified and we're trying to combat is every single time we talk to law enforcement, hey guys, it's not just a civil issue. It, it may be a civil issue, but it can also be a crime. And so we're, we're re, we really are making sure, and law enforcement is on board. They, they hate seeing elders being victimized and taken advantage of in the community, and they want to help. So we're providing them the resources and the education and the training to hopefully kind of bridge that gap and uh, stop having these cases fall between the cracks like that. Hey, Karen, can I ask you a question? Maybe uh, this will help the audience too. I think it gets confusing about the different levels of law enforcement. So you're at the Attorney General's office, and that's different than your former job as a prosecutor with the State Attorney's office, right? And then yeah. there are other levels of state, there's federal. Can you kind of give us an idea of what offices do what? Absolutely. So uh, the difference between the Office of Statewide Prosecution as opposed to the Office of Attorney General is based off of uh, the, the jurisdictional what types of cases we're going to prosecute, what types of cases fall under the statewide parameter. Believe it or not, statewide, even though it sounds like a larger type of organization, it's a, a smaller, more concentrated type of prosecution. And it's aimed at criminals who are really going widespread, targeting victims or um, conduct, criminal conduct in multi-jurisdictional ways. So they're going across circuit lines and going from county to county and committing crimes, maybe the same crime uh, against multiple victims, maybe transporting things between circuits, but that's how statewide typically will get jurisdiction and get involved in the case. They're looking, we are looking for the large systematic abuses. Contrastly, the state attorney's office, uh, the, the individual circuits that you are more familiar with are going to be the ones who are dealing with a lot of our exploitation cases and the things that are happening in one place with one victim or maybe a group of victims but all happening in the same location. Um, we do have crossover there. There are cases that the statewide office has taken um, that involve a single circuit, but there are other ways that we've gotten jurisdiction. I personally have open investigations involving exploitation of elderly adults right now. Um, and there also may be crossover in jurisdiction between the state and federal levels too. We may all have jurisdiction, and uh, sometimes that's a fun game to determine who's going to who's going to take the lead on that one. Okay. Wonderful, thank you. All right, what I wanted to do with, uh, with you three is to give the audience some idea of um, a couple tips that you would have uh, for exploitation prevention. We've had a lot of information today, wonderful information about. Uh, the whys and the hows and what we might, you know, some possible ways to prevent exploitation. I wanted you all to share your top two, maybe your top three uh, prevention methods. And it can be ranging from what the individual does to maybe the network that the individual or the family would have. So um, who wants to go first? Okay, I'm more. <laughs> I'm going to almost call you Ashley. <laughs> I take it as a compliment. I mean, I really do. I love it. All right. And coincidentally, my husband's name is actually James Moody, and that's her dad's name, I believe. And so it's kind of funny, actually. So, all right. So I think the first thing that everybody has kind of gotten a really good understanding of today, and I'm sure throughout your practices as well, you know this, but prevention is so much better than a prosecution. Um, because when you're involved in a prosecution or a criminal investigation, you really don't know who you're going to be dealing with as the investigator, who you're going to have as the prosecutor. I can tell you that when I left my position as the division chief for the Elder Crimes Unit, the prosecutor who came in after me, he was a very zealous prosecutor, and we radically differed in our opinion on what was fileable, what was, you know, triable. 
Um, I was always kind of like, let's do this, and if we fail, we fail, and he was really, um, I mean, we really got into some battles over some of my cases that I was like, you are not dropping that case. So firstly, prevention is by far the best thing. The way that I have found that you do that is you definitely need some some eyes on people. We have a great program in Brevard County in Satellite Beach. Um, it's called Stop By and Say Hi. It is volunteers out of the Satellite Beach Police Department that just go to isolated individuals who don't have any family, um, nobody who really checks in on them who still live at home. They go and visit them once a week and just sit with them for like an hour or two to see how things are going. I found that through my experience, it's not really necessarily the, you know, the cognitive impairment that's causing people to fall prey. It, as you heard, it's, it's, it can be a multi-factor type of issue. Really, a lot of the victims that I ever worked with, they just wanted someone to talk to. So unfortunately, the person they got to talk to was the guy who was gonna marry them and you know, Jamaica or Nigeria or where, whatever country they were from. They were just waiting to get over to the United States to pick them up. And um, so really just having somebody to talk to or somewhere to go or something to do um, seems to be one of the biggest biggest factors in what I had seen when people are far less willing to share their money. Another thing that, you know, we always, and I see this with people who are new prosecutors to elder crimes or new investigators to elder crimes is like, well, why don't they just not give the money? And I'm like, well, because they like to give the money sometimes because that causes the person to come around again. So you kind of have to understand what is motivating the, um, you know, the participation, when it's just an outright theft and a taking that a person's not aware of, that's a whole different situation. But when it's an exploitation case where the person is participating in, in you know, funding the money over, there's a lot of reasons that that happens. And so those are the things that I think you kind of have to look at if you are friends, family, um, you know, attorneys, service providers, when you're watching what your clients are doing, you gotta figure out why they're doing it, and it's not as simple as like, well, why don't they just stop? I mean, that's just never really the greatest answer. So you gotta figure out what it is that is you know, causing them to want to participate in that, or are they afraid? Um, are they enjoying the communications? Do they want to give their million dollars away because they really kind of like this person? Because thieves generally are pretty nice in the beginning, so they kind of like them, and sometimes they like them better than their family. So you gotta, you have to kind of understand the dynamic of what's happening before you can really curb it. I have a question for you, Laura, before you pass the mic. Um, when you were at the state attorney's office, did were more of the prosecutions uh, against third parties unrelated or family that was related? I would say I think it was probably half and half related versus unrelated. Probably 80 to 85 percent known. So it was almost always somebody who was familiar to the person, um, about half and half, whether it was a, you know, a service provider or a family member, um, but definitely almost always it was somebody known to them. Thanks. All right, well, you wanna go next? Sure, I have three. First and foremost, always verify credentials. What does um, that mean? Okay, so you I'm 92. Can, and you're 92, okay. So I know that you probably can't use the internet on your own, but you can call your local library and those librarians will be very helpful. You can do things like, for instance, if you have a financial planner who is calling you to sell you crap, you can look up and see on brokercheck.com if they actually have a license um, to be a broker. If they don't, the Florida Department of Financial Services, you can verify if they have an insurance license. Um, if they are a CNA, a nurse, a physician, um, you can verify those through the Florida Department of Health. You can verify if somebody's a professional guardian through the OPPG, the Office of Public and Professional Guardian. So the first thing you should always do is verify. The other thing, in Florida that we have that 
many other states don't have is we can very easily, for little or no money, verify whether somebody's a criminal. So for, I think it's like $27, you can verify whether or not somebody has been convicted of a crime or pled guilty in the state of Florida. So if you have that nice lady that you heard about at church coming in to take care of your mom, and I don't mean the people at church, I mean somebody that sits next to you in the pew says, I have this really great lady who took care of my mom for $10 an hour under the table, why don't you hire her? Well, she probably works for $10 an hour under the table because she's a felon and can't work for a regular agency. So before she comes into your home, you can do a simple Florida background check. The other thing you can do if you can't afford the $27, the Florida Department of Corrections has an inmate and offender search. And if somebody has been through the Department of Corrections, their picture and their information will show up on the website. And you can see if that lovely lady ever was a guest of the state of Florida. <laughs> so that's my first thing. The second thing is if you're hiring somebody to do something, you must initiate the contact and you must hire from a reputable place. So for instance, in the panhandle, we got hit by this little hurricane called Michael. And so I have a lot of my clients in the panhandle who are, you know, people knock on their door, I see you have, a, you know, branches in your yard or a hole in your roof or whatever, I can fix it, just give me a check. Well, I actually have some clients who did that because they were desperate to get the branch out of their driveway or out of their roof or whatever. Well, many of them got scammed. So, in, and then the other side of hiring through an agency, if you need somebody to care for you or a loved one, don't hire the lady that that person told you about in church. Hire from an agency. They've had a background check, the agency has insurance, they usually have some kind of mechanism if the lady steals all your jewelry, you, you know, there are ways, so these are protections. Yes, it's gonna cost you a little bit more money, but it's probably not gonna cost you $186,000 in a savings account, which is the last one I dealt with three months ago. And my third one is to your family and friends, just say no. It's a Nancy Reagan one, it was no. really easy. Just say no. And that means to the good daughter and to the bad daughter and to the grandson. I have grandchildren. If, if I get the call about my grandson being in some jail in South America, he's nine, gonna be 10. We're already prepping him to stay in that jail. <laughs> I, they all, from jail's a real place, honey. And if you go there, you're gonna call your mom because Oba is not bailing you out. So those are my three uh, uh, tips. Well, I love working with you. I'm gonna get to your uh, one. Hold on. So if well, the $27 background check, how does someone go about getting that? You go on, I wanna say it's FDLE's website, and you need to know their name, their date of birth, and their social security number. And, um, well, if you're hiring somebody in your home, if you're hiring somebody to come into your home and they won't give you that information, Katie bar the door, don't let them in. They're gonna steal you blind because you, you know, they can tell you they're Willie Sutton, who by the way, is my favorite bank robber. Uh, legend has it that when a um, journalist asked him why he robbed banks, he said, duh, that's where the money is. And so I use that same philosophy in elder exploitation. Why do old people get robbed? Duh, they have the money. We heard that earlier today. So if they're not gonna give you those three things so you can do a background check, you should never let them in your life. So the FDLE would be the Florida Department of Law Enforcement? Yes. And um, I don't have a phone number for them, but um, I, I like to suggestion of, all, all of her suggestions are online, so anyone who doesn't have a computer ready uh, would want to access either the library or a friend's computer. Um, Sadly, phone books are a thing of the past, so I think we get one delivered that's about this big, and it's like a little, you know, postage stamp size, so you can't really rely on phone books a whole lot anymore, but 
you know what I would suggest perhaps keeping a list of these important numbers handy with you, with your friends, family, you know, the people that you associate with, have it next to your phone, in your wallet, uh, most important numbers, uh, such as Adult Protective Services, who we have in the room today. 1-800-96-ABUSE. Yeah, so get yourself ready so that you don't have to worry about finding this information when you are at that level of stress, like the young lady spoke to us earlier, uh, in the fight or flight um, stage. So get your you know, preparedness, uh, makes a big difference. Uh, Laura, I'm gonna go to you and then I'll go to here. I just wanted to comment on one thing. Just as not a good idea to invite the felon in to be the caregiver who is the joint account holder on the bank account and has access to the credit cards, also, though, I'd like you guys not to be lulled by the um, lack of a criminal history because the va when you ask who we prosecute, the vast majority of my elder offenders had zero criminal history, which is why they were passing background checks, which is why they're working in the home health agencies, which is how they got access. So, so I've also heard that stuff from people. Well, they didn't have a criminal history, so how was I supposed to know? So don't be lured into the idea that we, a lack of criminal history is a, a validation of some sort, too. So, excellent okay, point. Same brain, Laura, same brain. <laughs> I was going, and piggybacking off of that, it's actually a fantastic point. When we're talking about contractors, we're talking about people coming in and providing services around the, the home, we do want to do these background checks, and we do want to make sure they're reputable. But keep in mind that there are two different types of crimes that we're really talking about here when it pertains to scams or fraud versus exploitation against the elderly or against other vulnerable adults. Exploitation is really a term of art within Florida that means that there is a special relationship between the perpetrator of the crime and that vulnerable adult. Either there is some sort of legal, fiduciary, power of attorney, guardianship relationship, a caregiver relationship, a business relationship, but some kind of special relationship there that allows that person to take advantage of this vulnerable adult. And there is some sort of vulnerability, not just age, but age plus some sort of impairment of some sort. There's alternatively those frauds, which all of us are, are very much susceptible for and vulnerable to, but for whatever reason, not for whatever reason, we know why. The criminals have decided that it is a good idea to target people who are older because they are more likely to have those nest eggs and have good credit if we're talking identity and theft issue. They're more likely to have assets. They're more likely to have heirloom jewelry and other things that it's actually really hard to trace later if we're looking for this in pawn searches and, and how they're going to be getting rid of those items later. Um, so the background search is, is important, very important, but as Laura mentioned most of our caregiver fraud actually starts with somebody who had no record whatsoever. In fact, most of my caregivers have had people come in after they've been convicted and testified at sentencing, hey, you're the, the nice person who goes to our church and leads our youth groups. It's crimes of opportunity in most of these situations where people are alone. They are not having family members or friends really coming by and keeping track of them or keeping an eye on their finances. Maybe it's a situation where the, the kids live out of town, live out of state, and maybe really just aren't keeping a close eye on what's going on. And they don't realize that mom or dad is starting to, to slip a little bit in terms of her, her ability to handle the finances or keep track of the finances. Or she's just really not even keeping track of where she left her checkbook. Once those signs start popping up, if nobody is looking for it, that's when the problems really happen with, with our caregivers and other people who are close to our vulnerable adults. So that was a very long-winded explanation and answer, but to get to my, my number one point as to prevention, the prevention of exploitation is about community. The way that we prevent vulnerable adults from being isolated and targeted is by keeping a network and a communication and a community in place and keeping an eye on our neighbors. You are very perceptive and you guys will have your spidey senses of we, as we've talked about it go off when you start seeing something doesn't seem right with my neighbor who normally is immaculately dressed, always perfectly composed, suddenly starts looking disheveled, or really, she can't remember, she told me that already in terms of our conversations. You're going to see those things happen more likely than somebody who is even a close relative but out of state. 
And you're also going to see if somebody starts hanging around near that vulnerable adult around that same time frame, if a caregiver or somebody who is uh, doing maintenance around the house suddenly starts driving around in a brand new car, and that's interesting. And also, it doesn't seem like the, our neighbor's bills are getting paid. Well, start putting two and two together. It's okay for you to report your suspicions. It's, in fact, encouraged for you to report those suspicions and get people involved. If you don't get a response right away, hey, there are plenty of people who are willing to take these reports and do a little bit of digging. Adult Protective Services, they're willing to go out and talk. Uh, I know my office is certainly willing to, to do what we can to investigate these, these situations. So it's about community and about staying plugged into what's going on with your neighbors. Awesome. Yeah, sorry. Yeah, no, that's great. So Karen brought up uh, every panelist brought up uh, things that I resonate with, uh, talking about like your gut, you've heard that several times today, your sixth sense, your spidey sense, whatever it is, um, go with it when the hair on your neck stands up or you just feel uncomfortable. Um, and then of course, while I was just say no, I preach that, I preach that, I preach that, I tell my clients repeatedly, you have a right to say no, say no, practice, say no, no, no. You can say no, thank you. You can say politely, have a nice day, no. Um, but say no. I also would like to encourage um, our audience members and people you know to not feel compelled to answer your phone right away. That's easy to say when you're by yourself, if you are isolated, if you're just waiting for any phone call, no matter what, you know, maybe just maybe it's just too difficult to um, to not answer the phone and then you get caught in that trap. But you know, I look, I get spam calls too. I get calls I think maybe of somebody I know, but I'm not sure. Maybe they haven't gone into my contact list yet. I just, you know, let it go, goes to voicemail. I listen to it, I'm like, oh my gosh, that's my friend. I didn't realize it was her call right back. Or I text her, it's okay. They don't have to have an immediate response from you, even if it's family. Um, Karen's point, report, what Twyla said, report to Adult Protective Services, 1-800-96-ABUSE. If you suspect, if you suspect, right, if you have any inkling that there might be abuse, neglect, or exploitation, Turn it in. It's completely confidential. It's anonymous. You will, nobody will tell on you. Nobody will know it's you. But then it gets an investigator out there very quickly to investigate, and maybe that's all it takes is to get someone um, to be on the scene, like the uh, stop by and say hi program. That's so awesome. You know, just to check in. Yeah. So um, okay, let's go to some more uh, maybe. Uh, I was going to say juicy, that doesn't sound good, but some of the meat and potatoes of uh, some of the cases. So, Twyla, I'm going to start with you because you and I discussed this. Um, let's uh, talk about one of your major exploitation cases, and let me ask you a few questions about it. So, first of all, think of the, the big case, and I think we talked about it. How did that case first come to you? Okay, so this is Sandy. Unfortunately, Sandy is one of the statistics that died because of exploitation. Sandy came to me, she was very ill. She had been forced to move into an apartment. She walked on a walker. She had a series of illnesses, congestive heart failure, kidney disease. Um, she had three vertebrae in her back fractured. She was a mess, but she was a wonderful no. lady. She was referred to me by a friend of hers that I was already representing my case. And she came to me because while she was in the nursing home after her third fall, her son got frustrated having to go to her house and help her and whatever, and he was an only son and he was allegedly getting burned out. And he told her that he was gonna build a little cottage for her to live in behind his pool that he just built, right by his house on the 10 acres that he and his wife owned. So she had written him three checks totaling just over $75,000. And for about the three and a half months that she was in the rehab, he was building this cottage for her. And he told her that she could not leave the facility until this house was built because he couldn't keep going to check on her in an apartment. And when she had sold her house because she actually lived way out in the rural area. So she had sold her house and gotten about $75,000 worth. So he took her money, 
he had her um, write some other checks to him and his wife. They built this pool house. I called the pool house. His lawyer called it the, the cottage for mom. The, yeah. So she, so, and, and you should know, son's wife and mom never got along. I know. I, I love my mother in law and stepmother in law, um, and, but I know lots of people who don't get along with their mothers in law, so I guess that's a problem. So she moves in. And about six weeks after she moved in, now, at this point, she was on a walker, she was on oxygen. She, on a bad day, had to be in a wheelchair. She had to have somebody come and help her bathe three days a week. And she had a series of friends who would come out to the house and check on her and take her grocery shopping. Her son was refusing to take her to the doctor, so her friends would come and take her. So about six weeks after she moved in, her son comes and says, you need to leave. Because my wife is going to leave me unless you leave this property. Oh, let me get this straight. It was her money that was used to build that pool house. Oh, oh yeah. But it was on his property. Oh yeah. And oh, and I forgot to tell you, in the interim, she actually asked to go to a lawyer, and the son said, Oh no, do that. It's gonna take up more time and you'll have to stay here longer. So while he was once the, the house was finished, he went and got some more home equity out of the property and bought himself a sixty-five thousand dollar pickup. So uh, she says, give me my money back, and I'll leave. And he says, it was a gift. I'm not giving it back. Get out. Well, she was stubborn, and she decided not to leave. So her son and her daughter-in-law um, proceeded to have lots of friends come over late at night, play very loud rap music. And she, was, she had a smartphone, so she would record some of this stuff. And at like midnight, they would be having drunken pool parties, um, playing loud rap music right outside her bedroom door. They adopted two bull, uh, pit bulls from a rescue and put them in a pen by her front door that she would, could get out to go through the pool area. So she had to go out the back door. Um, they started photographing every car that came up to her door to help her. She, they called the cops on three or four of her friends because they were exploiting the mom, so none of her friends were coming. So eventually she had to move out. And this was pre the exploitation injunction. So here you have this elderly woman, and she's got no place to go. She has about $3,000 a month in income, serious health problems, and no more life savings. And nothing. So she came to me, and it was very clear within a couple of years she was going to end up in a nursing home, if not sooner. And so not only could we not say this was a gift and just let it go, if we did that, she would never qualify for Medicaid that we, she was now going to have to rely on when something serious happened. So all of us taxpayers were going to end up paying for her son to have a pool house and a nice pickup. So we had to file a lawsuit. And all lawsuits get sent to mediation. At mediation, the son's lawyer in front of the mediator, who immediately cut off mediation and said, yeah, we're done here. He said, well, if she's that sick, we'll effing wait till she dies. And for the next eight months, that's, they just jerked around and jerked around and jerked around. She was found dead in her apartment by one of her friends. Um, she apparently had laid there for two days over the weekend, dead. Um, her son, karma's gonna get you. Um, her son is now in the middle of a very ugly divorce where his wife is accusing him of domestic violence. They've had to file bankruptcy and their lovely house is in foreclosure and the $65,000 pickup has been repossessed. Wow, I just, every time I hear one of these stories, I just have to stop and remember to breathe because they're just so horrifying. I mean, how in the world could a child do this to his parent? So you kind of rushed on it, but um, quickly, the, um, were there major impediments in you being able to stop the exploitation? Or had he already accomplished all the exploitation? He had already taken all of her money. He had already, we, we did discovery. 
Um, what is that? Discovery is when you go out and get documents about where this money is and where the how much the house costs and all of this. He had taken the money, he had put it in his bank account, he had hired his friends to help him build this house. So all of the money was already gone. It was already in the pool house. And so there, in order to get, so in Florida we have what's called the homestead, which protects your home from judgments against you. Even criminal activity, unless you can prove that the money you got from the criminal activity went directly into the homestead, which we could do, but that takes a whole lot more effort. So that was our first impediment was there was no money to get back. My second impediment was my client was very ill and my client wasn't living in a place where she really was getting the supports she needed and she couldn't afford to live. She really needed to be in assisted living. Cognitively, she was fine, but she was at fall risk and she had all these other health problems, but she couldn't afford to get that care. And her, her son, between the nursing home and the time she was in the house, had so isolated her that she really only had like three friends who paid attention to her. And so she didn't have any social supports. We would have to, in a couple of cases, she was so, so sick, we had to go to her house to prepare her for her deposition. We had to do things for her that we wouldn't normally do for clients because she was so sick. Our other impediment was, this was her only son. And she was really tormented about prosecuting him. And he was such a jerk. He got his father, her ex-husband, to call and harass my client about how could you do this to your only son. Law enforcement wouldn't prosecute him because he was part of law enforcement in that county. At one point, he got two of his law enforcement friends to come out in the middle of the night to quote unquote do a wellness check on her when he knew darn well she was there, but he was just trying to make her life so miserable that she would move out. Hey Karen, is this something that the Attorney General's office could help with? If there's a law enforcement, you know, kind of an internal issue with someone, I mean, look, law enforcement's not, um, you know, above reproach. I mean, just because you're in a uniform doesn't mean you couldn't commit bad acts. So if you had something like this where you have a local law enforcement agency that won't do their job, what happens then to try to get in and help the victim? I mean, absolutely. When we're talking about a local law enforcement agency, now I'm going to throw out my disclaimer here and tell you that this is the anomaly, this is the exception to the rule, and yes. law enforcement 99.9% .9 are doing their jobs and doing it to the best of their ability, but I myself have prosecuted a law enforcement officer for committing an act of domestic violence. So we all know that like in every profession, there are going to be people who do not play by the rules, and there are, there are mechanisms and penalties available for that. Certainly, the first place to go to is the law, the law enforcement uh, police department itself, and that may seem like it's counterintuitive, but the police department itself has an internal affairs structure that is actually set up to take these complaints, analyze them, and take immediate uh, resolution and disciplinary action and possibly termination and prosecution is warranted. Also, the Florida Department of Law Enforcement is another avenue that we sometimes will go through if there are nobody's doing anything with the local police department but it needs additional oversight, then you can certainly turn to the Office of Attorney General to ask where to go, or the Department of Law Enforcement to ask where to go, and we can guide you through that process. Um, I don't know if you want me to do Yeah, so let me ask both Karen and Laura this. So we've got Twyla's client um, who her son took everything, left her destitute, uh, and there was property potentially available. He invested in his own property with mom's money, ill got gained. So Laura and Karen, how do we go after how do we go after that property um, from the son? Homestead, um, can we get restitution? What do we do, Laura? Okay, so this is where I think an underutilized tool that in your communities, if you can train your prosecutors, train law enforcement to bring it up to the prosecutors, is that in the 2014 legislation, we added an asset seizure section purposefully so that we could go after assets prior to the case being concluded. So what traditionally happens in a prosecution 
and Twyla brought it up, and this is um, not germane to just the civil realm. In, in a criminal case, what do you think the number one defense is for defense attorneys? <laughs> Wait for the victims and witnesses to not be available, right? So I mean, this is a strategy that defense attorneys will use as well is to try to wait out the case. I never saw a defense attorney ever push an elder crime because the best way you can defend that case is to never have to defend the case. So, so the biggest thing we saw a need for was to try to go after assets and restitution prior to the conclusion of the case. So there is a section in 825 that actually allows for a pre-trial hearing, much like a restitution hearing, where now the key is you've got to make sure your law enforcement sees the property. That's the biggest thing. There has to be a search warrant done. If it's an account that you want to go after, a bank account you want to go after, or a piece of real property potentially, if you can prove that it's the proceeds from the exploitation that bought the item, a vehicle, an account, or a real property, the biggest thing is it's got to be seized by a search warrant. So that requires your law enforcement agents to actually seize it by a search warrant. And once that's been done, your prosecutors can hold pre-trial hearings to prove that that property is actually the property of the victim in the case. A court can come in and award that property prior to the disposition of the case. So that's one thing that I think is very underutilized. The other thing too, if you have your law enforcement agencies look at to do actually asset forfeitures, any felony in Florida, if you can show money, currency, real property, vehicles, assets are the proceeds of a felony, and that's under chapter 932, your law enforcement can seize an item for forfeiture. Now, do courts like asset forfeitures? No. Um, they, they don't like them anymore. They're much more difficult than they used to be. The burden is higher. The burden is the highest civil burden there is. It's a beyond a reasonable doubt standard in a civil forfeiture as well. However, if you know definitively that you've got, say, a daughter or a son who's taken money, a million dollars out of an account and opened another account, and you can trace that, the nice thing about these crimes is it's all on paper. It's black and white. Um, if you can trace monies, you can look to your law enforcement. You're probably going to get need to get somebody who's really seasoned, who understands financial crimes. But I never have seen um, much utilization of the asset forfeiture statute in elder crimes because because people are always thinking of drugs and narcotics, and we use them for you know drug cases, narcotics cases. It's still a felony. They're the same thing. So if you can trace proceeds from a felony, that's another tool. And then lastly, I'll just touch on this. You know, I hear a lot of times, and this is true, if you get a restitution order at the conclusion of a criminal case and you put somebody out on probation, I know the, the um, people who are upset about the probation, the issue is if they don't have the ability to pay, courts aren't going to punish them because we're not going to put people in prison if they don't have the ability to pay. However, guess what? As a prosecutor, you can encourage people to do ahead of time. Don't negotiate the case until they pay. So one of the biggest things that if you can encourage people is like, well, we're not going to agree with that plea offer until they agree to bring the check to the sentencing. Bring the check up front. Um, so when I was looking at restitution, now the one thing you can't do, just so everybody knows, the courts frown upon you negotiating away, like you can't negotiate some prison time away for the payment of restitution. Courts frown upon that. So don't encourage your prosecutors to do that. However, they don't have to sign the papers until you know satisfaction has been made of some sort. So you know, educating the prosecutors as to how to you know get restitution in advance. Do you think if you had somebody who's never seen the inside of a jail cell, they are not willing to figure out a way to get all their friends together? I mean, they get their friends together to get bond to get out of jail or to get themselves an attorney. So when it comes down to you know going to prison versus coming up with the you know fifty thousand dollars to pay somebody back, I've seen people come up with remarkable amounts of money in a very short period of time when it when it um, can be the difference between somebody being able to eat and pay the rent, and sometimes that's the biggest thing. Most of the victims I ever talked to, all they wanted back was their money. 
They could care less for those a few wanted to see the person behind jail cell doors. Um, but for the vast majority, they just want their money back so that they can buy food and pay for their house and pay for things. So you can be kind of creative with that. But the things that I see underutilized that I would recommend in your communities is the asset forfeitures and the, um, the asset seizure that we actually included in Chapter 825 to try to do this pre-trial. I have a couple of questions. Okay. So first, in my case, law enforcement told us that it was a civil matter and there was nothing that could be done. So my question Here is, is yes. yes, so in, in this case, so not only did law enforcement, I also called the state attorney's office who was over all of our counties and I was told the same thing. So if, if, if that asset seizure is only available if the person is prosecuted, right? Only if they are arrested for crime, okay. yes. And yeah, I mean, you're gonna have to have a criminal case, a criminal arrest, or something that accompanies it. Um, the other thing I will always say too is when you are talking about family, it is very difficult to ask a mother to testify and cross again, prosecute her son, or her daughter, or her grandson, or her granddaughter. And I always knew I was asking the world of them because most people would just rather their bad son have the property than to prosecute them. So it's a monumental thing. It's much like I always call these cases, they are like domestic violence cases on steroids because you're talking about family relationships. You're talking about somebody who may have has diminished faculties or the you know abilities to do the activities of daily living or physical um, issues going on. So you just always have to recognize that. But yeah, I mean, I think you're gonna need a criminal case to be able to utilize the asset forfeiture and the seizure aspects of the statute. So my second question is, if you get somebody, if you get law enforcement to arrest and you get your state attorney to prosecute, how much involvement does the victim or the victim's guardian actually get in plea agreements? Because my experience has been essentially none. So, I mean, according to Florida Constitution and according to our, our precedent that we have in Florida, the victim must be put in and aware of all relevant proceedings, must be able to be present at all relevant proceedings and dispositive um, portions of the case, including knowing ahead of time what the plea offer is that's being conveyed. So, from my perspective as a prosecutor, I never conveyed a plea offer without having first discussed it with a victim or the victim's uh, family member, guardian, next of kin, if, if my victim was not available or did not have capacity. So there absolutely should not be any anything going on without the victim being aware of it. Now, that is not the same thing as saying that the victim is always going to be on the same page or in agreement with a plea offer, and that does occasionally happen. And that can go one of two ways. Occasionally, we go, as prosecutors, we see somebody who has taken advantage of a vulnerable person. We want to make sure that we prosecute them fully. And we're talking about a, a very difficult issue like a family member. And a mom and dad may not want to see that prosecuted as, as much as we need to see that prosecuted based on the history and other factors. Conversely, there may be a situation where a case has to be resolved without jail time in order to satisfy other needs of a victim, such as getting that money back for a nest egg. And I've had many people who have been really frustrated because they say, I want my money and I also want to see this person go to jail for what they did. And yeah, I, I agree with you. And we should try to, we should advocate for the, the best possible outcome in all of these situations. But there are times where a first time offender is not going to like get incarceration if they go to trial and are convicted. You have to know the, the situation of your, you know, your judges, your, you have to know your, your uh, community, you have to know a lot of different factors, but there may be situations where we don't necessarily obtain the exact outcome in a plea that the victim was hoping for originally, but that's never going to happen without their, their knowledge of it in advance. So one of the um, wireless issues she and I spoke about before was that if you get a restitution order, not a seizure or anything like that, just a simple restitution order based on a conviction or an entry into a plea, uh, perpetrator says, I, okay, I acknowledge I'm going to have to pay this money back. 
So let's just say you get a restitution order, maybe it's in payments, right? Or it's, uh, can you get the wages garnished, um, voluntary garnishment, or? There are mechanisms for a wage garnishment. Okay. Now, like the, 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 these are very difficult issues once we start getting into the realm of post-conviction um, civil restitution order. I'll tell you that my philosophy has always been exactly what Laura said, which is a bird in the hand is worth two in the bush. If I can get the money up front, however much that's going to be, I'm incentivized by the best I can with my plea offers. Um, if money is what we're really trying to get back for security and peace of mind for our victim, then that is really what we need to get up front. Because we can put somebody on probation who clearly has assets, but suddenly they, they no longer have those assets and they're unable to work. If we're talking about somebody who's of working age, oh, you know, I, I have this, this problem that now makes me uh, uh, qualify as disabled and I'm on a limited income and I can't afford to pay back these monthly payments. And these are all of my creditors and things. If we can't show as prosecutors in a violation of probation hearings, this is likely the way that this would come about, uh, that the person is intentionally, willfully refusing to make those payments, that they have an ability to pay and they're willfully, intentionally refusing to make the payments. We can't meet that standard. We can't have any consequence for that person as a result of that. Uh, we don't have debtors prisons in Florida or the United States anymore. I know everybody has their own feelings on that subject, but <laughs> there is, you know, there is a reason that we negotiate these uh, very carefully, especially when it comes to financial crimes, when it has devastated somebody, because it robs them not just of the money, but of their security, their nest egg, and what they were planning on, on relying and living on for the remainder of their years. And that's a, a difficult balance to strike as a prosecutor. Important lessons, burn in the hand, get the money up front, property money, whatever it is. For. The other thing, too, a lot of people are not aware of is a criminal restitution order can be recorded just like a civil judgment. So if you do get a criminal restitution order that people aren't making payments on, you can still record them as if they were a lien. You can put a lien on a person's house if they own a house and they can't set, they, they won't be able to do anything yet until they try to sell it. They're going to have to satisfy that. And you can actually do wage garnishment as well if you have a criminal restitution order, but you're gonna to need to know where they're working and you've gotta file the paperwork to get that done. But a lot of people are not aware of the fact that you can utilize a criminal restitution judgment just like a civil judgment. So you can attach it to their property, you can attach it as a wage garnishment as well. And well, for any prosecutors that are out there or law enforcement that are out there looking for ideas or suggestions, I always, always, my, my plea sheets look ridiculous sometimes to judges, but I put in as many caveats as possible in you must disclose all assets, bank accounts, all income, all anything that you could potentially benefit from, you must disclose that. And I give them specified periods and an ongoing reporting requirement because we don't necessarily know where they've hidden the money. And if we find out later on that they've hidden the money and they are not reporting that to the courts, hey, guess what? That is a violation of their probation. Just food for thought. And a minimum monthly payment. Because if you can pay $50 a month at least, like when they stop paying that, it's easy to prove if they can still pay the $50. So I always included at least some kind of monthly payment so that you know, we'd be able to potentially violate them. So Twyla, if you're doing this in the civil arena, um, how are you getting paid to uh, sue people and try to recover in the civil courts versus the criminal courts? Well, in Sandy's case, I didn't get paid because I just took it on because it was such a bad situation. Um, oftentimes, when I get involved, um, I most of the time get involved when there's a guardianship. And so, um, the families, um, I, I charge by the hour. In some cases, I will make an agreement where it's by the hour up to a certain point and then a percentage of if we recover anything. Everybody's aware about the, you know, we'll take 25% or 30% or whatever. Most of the time, there's no money left and your recovery is impossible. In Sandy's case, when we did the um, analysis about where the money went, the guy had mortgaged his property to the fullest extent. 
So there was, we weren't going to get anything out of the property. Those were priority liens. Yeah. And so we were looking at his, um, um, so, you know, his income. Well, if we got a civil judgment out of his income, he was very religious, allegedly, and so he had lots of children because he was repopulating the planet with God's warriors. I'm not kidding. That that was what he said. I, I think it was funny, but so when you did the analysis for what could be garnished, you weren't really going to get anything. So in her case, what we were really doing was trying to do what Lisa said, get him, because the wife's family was actually exceedingly wealthy. They lived in another state. We knew they had a lot of money. So we were hoping that we filed this, we served him at his job, you know, we hoping that, you know, their good Christian values would say, ooh, we want this to go away, and so they would pay her off. That did not go that way. Um, so at the end of the day, most of the time, I am paid by the hour. Sometimes I don't get paid at all. Um, and sometimes if there is a recovery, I get a percentage of what is recovered over and above the hourly rate up to a certain point. So chasing the money and the property is really difficult. Um, from our former prosecutors, I know we're getting close on time, and I think you may want to open it up for a little audience question. OK. Um, so uh, yes. oh. Accomplices. So if you have like the wife and the money goes in, right? Take them, steal the money from mom. Son steals the money from mom, or, or unduly influences her to get it to him to build this pool house. Uh, and the wife is part of the joint marital property, and the wife's in on it, has knowledge, etc. Is there um, value to bringing in the spouse or other parties that you know maybe to negotiate? <laughs> they don't like that question. <laughs> in our case, we sued the wife, too, and we served her at the elementary school where she worked. Sometimes there's power in numbers, and sometimes they can go the other direction, but yeah. So, I mean, these are very complicated issues, and keep in mind that we have a standard of proof that not just to prove that trial, we actually have to have a specific standard or threshold in order to even file charges against somebody. So we're not going to just file... If it seems like somebody might have been involved, we have to be able to show evidence that they knew what they were doing, that they participated in it, that they took an active role knowingly in what was going on. So it really, it depends on how involved the wife really was during this and what her involvement consisted of. Um, certainly she, if she's taking the money and assisting her husband in doing that and benefiting from it, I can certainly see it wandering in. I, I, can see, I can see prosecution being beneficial potentially. Um, also keep in mind that there are, in some concepts, people think, okay, well, you know, charge them both and then flip somebody because everybody watches Law and Order and all of those different shows. And I'd love to, but keep in mind that there are spousal immunity privileges within Florida as well. So it's not necessarily going to be quite so black and white or quite, quite so easy um, at the end of the day. And it, sometimes charging both Backfires. Yeah, yeah I, I completely echo all of that. I have an actual exploitation example of this and how the role the person has matters. So I had a, it was a boyfriend and a girlfriend, but they had moved in on um, World War II veteran, and, and she was the agent with power of attorney. He was the boyfriend living in the house. They actively, I mean, both of them, it was quite clear, were exploiting her. They isolated her. They cut off all of her friendships. Um, but she had died prior to law enforcement ever being involved. So we really had, and she did not have dementia or any capacity issue that we could have latched on to. So we were really left with a breach of a fiduciary duty by power of attorney. It was really the only theory of prosecution we were going to be able to get to. Now, the boyfriend really benefited, I mean, hundreds of thousands of dollars. She, the girlfriend who was the agent with power of attorney was sinking all this money into a business for him, and he had all these things, and I mean, the family was devastated when I explained to them, listen, I can't attach any criminality to him. How do I prove that he knew she didn't have the authority to do this or that he actively participated. Because in Florida, it is not enough to know that a crime is occurring. You can sit there at the bank robbery with a person holding the gun and you can have ridden with them, but unless you actually do something to encourage the conduct, to participate in the conduct, to be um, something more than just knowing about it, it's not enough. And so we ended up prosecuting 
power of attorney. We did not prosecute boyfriend, although he benefited quite a bit, um, but we could never prove how he participated in any form of a crime because we couldn't attach any kind of a fiduciary relationship to him. Um, they weren't in a business relationship. We couldn't prove at that time it was the deception and intimidation that you had to prove. We couldn't prove that. So, so she was prosecuted. He was not. So just get him on failure to report, uh, mandatory report, or failing to report uh, abuse and neglect or exploitation. So Mr. Beer, thank you. Yeah. Hey, Vic. I yeah. mean, he would he would have argued that they loved each other. It was all a gift. They had a great relationship, and she wanted her to have everything. And she was deceased, so we could not disprove that. Yeah, they spent it all, and then there she went. Hi. Hi. I have a question. Okay. I wonder how much um, effort goes into finding the right mediator. Are you looking at a typical circuit civil mediator who regularly mediates some other kind of cases? Or are you looking at someone who specifically has had both elder mediation training and victim offender mediation training? Well, when I'm looking for a mediator for exploitation cases, I'm actually, um, I actually want somebody who is a circuit civil mediator and not necessarily a social worker. The reason I want that is because I need somebody who is able to understand the actual court processes. Social workers are really, really great at talking people through things in mediation, but if your mediator does not understand the actual court processes, they can't beat up the sides about what's going to happen when you go to court, my side and the bad guy's side. So first of all, I always want a lawyer who's a certified circuit mediator or a lawyer who does mediation and I know that, like, if I were involved, I would probably have somebody like Victoria be a mediator if she wasn't involved in the case because she knows exploitation, she knows guardianship, she knows civil stuff. And so part of what mediation does, at least when I go into it, is trying to get the parties to see the flaws in both sides of their cases so that they need some place in the middle and we get some money back. Um, that's the civil side. I, I would tell you that any mediator, no matter what their previous background is, should be able to do that. The question is, is the mediator trained in both elder mediation and victim offender mediation? That's the key. Is the additional training <coughs> beyond what their background was? Well, and I agree. So somebody who does just insurance defense or, or has, has just done like car accident, PI, I probably wouldn't use them. The mediators I do use, I know they have experience in probate and guardianship and they work with elders. Up in our court, part of the state, we don't have the luxury of having, you know, 50 mediators that have elder law training. So that's part or elder certification training. So. Um, but that's what I'm looking for. And it doesn't, to me, it doesn't necessarily matter that you've got elder certification training, which by or, uh, elder law, because that's not actually a Florida Supreme Court designation yet. It's extra training you can get. And I would appreciate that very much. We don't really have a lot of that up where I'm at. So um, I look for people who have experience in aging issues, the probate and guardianship court, and understand the civil process. Because I'm not just litigating, if I have a guardianship case where I have an exploitation, I not only have to worry about the probate and guardianship rules, I also have to worry about the circuit civil rules. And so I have to have somebody that can stand in both of those courts. So when I'm looking for somebody, that's who I'm looking for. And I know I'm standing here giving you an ice cream, but I see you guys taking notes as to potential resources. I don't know if you guys are listening to this, but AARP has a podcast called A Perfect Scam or The Perfect Scam, one of the two. And it goes over financial exploitation and financial frauds against the elderly in a great, great way. So if you haven't listened to it, please, please give it a listen. And I say that especially for prosecutors and law enforcement too, because it is very informative to how these scams work. It's called The Perfect Scam by AARP.